This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Art Mojo with Melinda Smith. And Melinda, you have a guest on today who I actually found for you. Um, there's a great group up there called Podmatch.com, and uh, Elizabeth was listed out there. And when I saw her backstory, I knew it was something that you would find very interesting because one of the things we talk about on here is challenges. So. Right. Let's go ahead and get this party started. So Mm -hmm. hi, Elizabeth. Welcome. I did a little reading on you. As she mentioned, you came through the the network. And I'm going to tell our listeners that you are a licensed clinical professional counselor, a women's life coach, and a business owner in Annapolis, Maryland. And you host your own podcast called Women Warriors. Warriors. Warriors, right? Well, actually, my podcast uh, has changed names since then. Oh. It's called the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. But yes, okay. Woman Warriors is still out there. But yep. yep. Okay. So you are basically helping people get healing done, the challenge of healing themselves. So yes. tell us a little bit about why you got into this field. So I, I'm a late bloomer. Um, I started college, you know, in my teens, like most people do when you go to college, you know, right after high school and probably completed about two years of college. And then at that time, it just wasn't the right thing for me. There was a lot going on in my life. I was paying for it myself. It was just a lot. It was a challenge. So, you know, went on to do various jobs in many different industries, service, as well as you know, taking care of kids in my home and preschool teaching. But when I had my own kids, I realized that there was a lot of healing that I had not done from my own childhood. And I wanted to be sure that I wasn't repeating some of the same patterns that I had experienced, Mm -hmm. same things. I didn't want to be, not that my, my parents were not bad parents. They did the best that they could with what they had, but I wanted to be a better parent. And so I started studying child psychology and really uh, that really hooked me, but I wasn't really, uh, I wasn't able to go back to school and get my master's in counseling psychology until, I mean, I started my master's at 50. So um, even though I feel like I've been helping people for a long time and I worked in a hospital, local hospital, and did a lot of crisis work there prior to going back for my master's, but, um, and, you know, getting my undergrad degree too. So, yeah. So it was really the idea of being a good parent that, that got me wanting to help myself so that I could help them. Uh, and, uh, I realized pretty quickly that working with kids was not for me and that Mm -hmm. I really wanted to focus on helping women. That's great. I understand. I went into psychology myself and I Mm -hmm. think I went from family trauma, you know, it gave me a base to work from. Also tried not to repeat with my boys, some of the things, but guess what you do anyway, or you make choices based on your background. I mean, that's all you can do. Nobody gives you a guide as a parent and said, here's the rules. Well, (laughs) go down these and you'll be fine. It just doesn't work (laughs) that way. So I've noticed a lot of women lately, that's an issue. I talk to a lot of different people and it really is an issue. So you're doing something very important, Mm, helping women. uh, Yeah. So you decided to help women. Tell me what that looks like for you. Yeah. So um, for my therapy practice, the focus is uh, helping women. Most women who come to me come because they're struggling with anxiety that was kind of the niche that niche I had built for myself because I had a lot of anxiety throughout my life. And so I was like, I know what this is like. I want to help others. And uh, so that I would say most women come to me looking for help to manage the anxiety and stress. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what we, what I work to help them uncover is just what experiences in their lifetime, maybe in their childhood, their upbringing that really um, 
created this perfect storm. So they also struggle with anxiety, right? And so just helping them get a better understanding of it, but also then tools to help them live a more satisfying, less anxious life. Um, so that's the work I do in therapy. And a lot of it is attachment focus. So looking at what our relationships were like with our parents and other caregivers to highlight some of those patterns, maybe they're recreating or else recreating inside themselves, sort of, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's that super critical part or, um, yeah, just feeling sort of unsafe and unsure in the world, um, but to help feel it, them feel more settled. Mm -hmm. Well, Lord knows there's a lot going on in our world right now to make us feel anxious and unsettled. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Yes. yes. So I've come across a lot of women online who because of whatever their family background is, or maybe not, their anxiety does go to their adult children. Mm -hmm. And their adult children all of a sudden push them away instead of working with them. Yeah. So are you, do you hear that a lot in your practice that they kind of lose touch with family members, their children or their own parents? Sometimes for sure. I know um, I'm probably working with a couple of people right now who are kind of man trying to figure out how to manage these relationships in adulthood, whether it's with their own children or with parents or, you know, other family members, because, um, yeah, because the stuff we carry, we do carry into adulthood. And sometimes it can make those relationships that really, um, that we care about, but also where maybe we have to be creating boundaries or safer um, relational uh, uh, experiences in those. In, in Do you think that, women today maybe are a little more focused on these issues because of social media, because they think everybody else has this perfect life? Um, I've joined two groups online. One is called the Ethel Circle through ARP. And the other is called Orphans Living Alone. And these are basically women 50 and up who think that they're the only ones who are hurting and mm. they don't know how to get rid of the hurt. And it's because people will look at them and say, isn't it sad you're all by yourself? Well, instead of saying wow. that, why don't we include them? Okay. Or the other issue is Melinda brought up they say that estrangement from our children is growing. And right now it's at 40% of all adult children are estranged from their families for one reason or another. That's a huge percentage. I didn't it is. was not aware of that. Yeah. I just read oh. it today and it shook me up because it's like. That's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. And what are we doing and how do we correct that? And of course, I think mothers and women take that more to heart mm -hmm. than the fathers. Yeah. 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 Well, since we were oh. usually the primary caregiver yes. and you've done the best you could, you got to wonder. And I will say I work in the senior care community. I have a, another business like you, mm -hmm. and I take care of a lot of single seniors. And mm -hmm. what I'm finding is it doesn't matter if you're 50 or 60 or 80, they all have the same problems. It's amazing to me. You know, yeah. You, you naively go in and you work with people and you think, oh, well, they're 80. There's no way that their 60 year old child is not spending time with them or not speaking to them. But guess what? So, so I believe that 40 percent, Karen, I do, because I see it every day. Mm. They wouldn't need me if family was coming to help, but they don't. True, so, true. so when you try to help people heal, do you have a certain model that you use or you know, are they different models? I imagine one size doesn't fit all, right? No, it really doesn't. But um, I, as I said, I sort of, what I'm looking for or listening for is the sort of attachment patterns that happened in, in, their, in my client's childhood. So were their parents able to really meet their emotional needs, obviously physical and and more uh, primary needs are important too. But when the emotional needs aren't met, it sets up a, uh, you know, stuff in our own system where, you know, maybe we 
don't feel fully loved, or maybe we don't fully love ourselves. Maybe we always feel like we're missing the mark or, or on the other hand, we're a perfectionist where we're just pushing to make sure that we do all the right things. So our parents, you know, back then loved us wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. you know, if we could just be perfect. Uh, so I'm looking for those patterns. And I also, um, I've been trained in internal family systems, which is what we call parts work. So listening for sort of seeing a person as a a system of parts. And so you may have, you know, a really compassionate part. You may have a really angry part. You might have, I don't know if you've seen the movie Inside Out, like sort of that sort of idea, like inside we are a compilation of all these parts. And if they've been wounded or hurt, that sets up another set of uh, um, system things that can happen inside where maybe we're, I know I grew up because of my history, really fearful, like just afraid all the time, which is then why I felt anxious all the time. And mm -hmm. to better understand that this is a part of me that I can heal so that today I feel more comfortable in myself, more accepting of myself, kinder to myself. And so what I'm hoping for my clients, whether it's through the coaching lens or the therapy lens is to help them build a compassionate, kind relationship inside towards themselves. Because if we can accept and love ourselves, it changes our relationships with other people too. Like that compassion and care shines out of us too, where we can be more compassionate to others because we know what it's like to give that to ourselves. If that makes sense. Yep. So how, I mean, I'm not asking you to psychoanalyze me here right now, but uh, how do you get somebody through that? Like, what do you do? Do they spend time talking to you? Because I think most people, especially a certain generation of people, young people seem to go to therapy just like that. Oh, I have to go to therapy. You see a trend. These tw between 20 and 30, 35, they all have an issue and they go to therapy. But people who are older, yeah. 50, 60, 70, therapy is like a no-no. That means you fail. If you have to go to therapy, it's failure. Yeah. So how do you really, get through that? Yeah. Just realized my video went really blurry. You're okay. You're okay. 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 Um, yeah. Well, I would say women are more likely to come to therapy than men. That would be what I would say. And I... Um, I would agree. I feel like, uh, you know, my own children, I have three boys, you know, ranging in age from 35 to 28. And they are all, <laughs> I think one of the happiest things I ever, I, one of the proudest moments is when they'll say, well, my therapist said, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I have not encountered too many people who come to therapy with me for the first time. So often either they were in therapy before or, you know, they're coming back to it. But when it's brand new, you know, I, I guess I just try to create a space that's safe enough to come with whatever it is that you're bringing, right? I'm there to listen. I'm there to hold that space with an open heart. And I, my hope is that that's what all therapists do. And of course, you know, you may come up against a therapist that doesn't fit you, which I appreciate too. Like it has to be a good relationship. You know, I didn't realize the difference in therapy. Um, my youngest son, who's in his thirties, was diagnosed on the spectrum. And so for years he went to therapy. And he would tell us, well, he'd tell the therapist every week, oh, yeah, I'm going to do everything you told me to do. He'd get in the car and he'd say, I'm not a dog. I'm not a trained dog. I'm not going to do those things. He picked up on it at a very early age, seven, eight years old. And it wasn't until about five years ago that he got into cognitive therapy. Mm. He doesn't want to leave because this is his way of going through things but looking at them very realistically. Whereas 
Now I understand all of our money, really, we wasted it because we go to therapy once a week when he was little. And, you know, we couldn't follow through as parents because he, he knew it wasn't for him. He was resistant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's where people get stuck is that it's okay to go to a therapist and if they're not right for you to go find somebody else. But what I have heard from my coaching clients is I was so embarrassed not to go back. I kept going back. And I mm. said, what'd you get out of it? Oh, you know, I lost my copay, you know, every couple of weeks, but I wasn't getting anything out of it. And that's when I say to them, that should have been a signal to you that oh, this is yeah. not the right therapist. There are plenty of them out there. Go look for the right therapist. Um, but you do coaching and therapy. How do you draw that line? Because there is a line between them. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I guess I see therapy as a way to work through and heal old wounds, right? So we're working to help a client, I don't know, function as to their best ability today, depend, you know, whatever happened to them in the past. Coaching, I see more as maybe the person, whether they've done the work with a therapist or on their own, they are at a, a more healed place, but they're still feeling stuck about a particular area in their life. And sure, there may be trauma issues that keep them stuck, but we do that work on a, a, less, a less deep level, I guess. We acknowledge it. We know it's there, but I trust that the client has skills and the tools, and maybe they even have a therapist to work on the really, truly wounded parts that need healing. Um, so it's, you know, my work focuses in coaching. Uh, I... I exclusively work with highly sensitive women. So really helping women who have high sensitivity manage their sensory input and, and the overwhelm that can come from that uh, in healthy ways. So what's the difference when you say high sensitivity? I think mm -hmm. it's maybe a listener would be like, what the heck does that mean? I mean, it's, you think about your five senses, right? if you have too much noise or too much light, but is it really that, or is it more than that? No, well, it is that, but, and more. So um, being highly sensitive means that your sensory system is like um, so highly tuned that you, maybe you, I'm very sensitive to noise, light sometimes, but also just when there's too much sensory stimulus coming at me. So it could be like a crowded space where there's like, I think about Christmas shopping, which just I can barely tolerate because you go to the mall and it's loud and it's music and it's just too much. Um, but for sensitive, highly sensitive people, we're also very highly tuned to the emotional, the, that, that, that sensory experience, the, you know, we feel very deeply, we pick up on others' feelings very quickly, um, highly empathetic typic typically, you know, mm -hmm. where we are really knowing and sort of reading a room, like, is this a, you know, are people happy here? Is there a lot of stress in this room? Is there a lot of, you know, um, conflict that's happening that I don't want to really be in, involved with, you know, so, uh, we feel deeply, we connect deeply, um, but we can get easily overwhelmed by sensory stimulus. Oh, I, I can relate to that because I went, so my background's in psychology and anthropology. I went to mm -hmm. graduate school and I chose to look at research because I felt I couldn't separate myself if I was a psychologist helping people. And what yes. do I do today? I help seniors. And that's exactly what I do. I get into their lives. That's what they need. They need someone to talk to. Not only do they need the physical help, but they need, the, you know, the conversation. Yeah. So I'm right back where I thought I wouldn't be. And it's a lot. It's a lot. There are some days where I can't listen to one more story. I bet. I bet. But it helps yeah. them. Sure. And that's, that's something that is, um, that I hear a lot uh, in the highly sensitive space is that it can be 
a lot, you know, we want to help. We want to be that person who can be there for others, but too much can lead to burnout for us. I know for me, I have to be really careful about how much I schedule myself, right? right. Because it would be easy to just keep saying yes, 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 because there's a lot of people in need, but I have to be really careful about the boundaries that I create in my own work schedule. So I don't get burned out. Right. Yeah. I and think I probably, people, yeah. And a lot of people okay. don't understand that burnout when you're doing the type of work you're doing. Um, you know, I started coaching a year ago, but I decided that I was putting limits as to when I would do it. And I've had a couple mm -hmm. of people contact me and say, well, no, I need eight o'clock on Monday nights. And it's like, and I appreciate that. And I have a whole list of other coaches and I'm not one who normally says no, but I knew that if I kept saying yes, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have even made it a year. And so it's important that your clients understand that sometimes you have those same issues that they do, but this mm -hmm. is how you work through them and give them that hint. That's how they can work through them. Yeah. 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 Well, it's good to model uh, healthy boundaries for yes. our clients as well as for ourselves. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what kind of skills do you think you need to give people like there's job stress, like we just talked about with Karen and with me, but there's also home stress. Mm -hmm. and when you can't leave that environment, at least not right away, what kind of strategies would you suggest that somebody do? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I would say that it's really important to, you know, especially, you know, I have a few clients that are parents of young children and they get overwhelmed if they, you know, are working too. It's reminding them that like their self-care has to be time away from the kids too. Like it can't just be parenting 24 seven or, you know, work then parent, work then parent. Like there has to be some time for them to regroup. What I, I think even just a mental shift, like if you can't, you know, say you work from home and your, you know, daycare provider is there in the house, you know, your, your, your childcare is there in the house. And so there really isn't a shift of like commuting or whatever to just give yourself that mental space of like, okay, I'm, I'm ending work now and I'm going to take time to whatever, change my clothes or, you know, go into the bathroom and wash my face and just sort of give yourself a mental break from one thing to the next, because just constantly being on is really hard. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. it, it wears you out. Um, I think other ways of like what I have found really helpful for myself is making sure there are spaces in my home that feel like me, right? Like coming into my office, I'm like, oh, I love all the things that I've put in here. It feels really homey. You know, that isn't always, um, uh, you may not be able to create a room that's for you, but even a corner, if you have like a little space that has, you know, photographs of the people that you care about or little uh, mementos from places you've been just to remind yourself of sort of being an individual and a human versus just a part of this other family, right? Or of this family. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when you're working with your clients, mm -hmm. are you, do they come to you? Is it online? So many things are online now. Yes, I am all virtual. Uh, I, I had a few clients that met with me virtually pre pandemic, pre, uh, you know, getting uh what was it called? <laughs> COVID. COVID. Yeah, during COVID, but when we all had to isolate, right? Yep. So I had a few clients before that. Fortunately, I had all the systems in place and uh, went full virtual then because we had to. Mm -hmm. But it really worked for me. Like I really, as much as I liked being face to face with clients, I also felt like it was an energy drain for me in a way that... that 
it was harder for me to create space between me and the client when I was in the same room with them. Mm -hmm. And that was really important. That is really important as a therapist to be able to sort of, as much as you're feeling and caring and being present with them to really feel like your own person and not just getting sucked in, as you said, to all the stories and all the, right. the, the pain. So uh, virtual really helps me because I'm in my own space. When the session is done, I can go play with my dog. I can go get a drink of water. You know, I can walk around my house, which is a, you know, is a really good place for me. So yes, so I am all virtual. So what about the individual who, for whatever reason, cannot find or claims they cannot find that space in their home? Um, mm -hmm. Because I know in my first marriage, everything mm -hmm. was set up the way he and his mother wanted it to be set up. Um, yeah. And I didn't think anything of it until I remarried. And here my husband is like, oh, do you want that on the wall? Sure, we'll put that on the wall. Oh, you want a green couch? We'll get a green couch. Um, but then it became ours, okay? And it really is only in the last couple of years that I've created a space for myself. When my son moved out, I just like took over his room. And I don't work out of his room, mm -hmm. but if I want a long time, house. I go yeah. in there and he's coming home for the weekend. And I said, and you're spending time in my room. Yeah. Good feeling. <laughs> like your she shed, you know, when they yeah. start showing it's your exactly. she shed. But there are people That's that great. either can't because they claim they don't have the space or somebody's going to interrupt them in that space. Or they won't yeah. let them. Yeah. 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 No, I, I appreciate that. And that's really hard. I mean, there is, you know, what other than really communicating your needs, you know, in a, in a very clear way um, with your partner or your family that like, this is the time I need. Um, I had um, a client who would basically say to their family, like, I'm taking 10 minutes, right? I'm closing my door, taking 10 minutes. And they, they would just take that 10 minutes to just be quiet to just like whether they laid on the bed or sat or whatever, but just made it very clear. Like this is the time I need to regroup, to take care of myself. Um, but it's hard if there are people in your life or people who feel threatened by you needing that space, that's, that's tough because yeah. especially I think women who want to take care of others, it's very easy to be like, Oh, it's okay. I don't need to, I don't need to take care of me. It's really okay. But that can lead to, yeah, burnout and um, yeah, a lot of anxiety. Well, Absolutely. that's what you do then. You help them understand this is what they're going through and yeah. try to give them a plan or help them develop a plan to give them their space. Yep. I remember when I was raising my boys, I have two boys, uh, 28 now. 27 and 24. You forget, right? They're not here. And yes. you don't... When they get older. I used to do. go in the pantry. I had yeah. a walk-in pantry and I'd go in the pantry and sit down. They could hide away in there for 10 minutes. Yeah. Because other I'd than that, I really didn't have my own door. space. Yeah. yeah. What'd you say? I said I would go in the bathroom. <laughs> like, just be like, oh. <laughs> yeah. But, but they yeah. still would find me in the bathroom. They didn't always find <laughs> me in the pantry. There you go. They had a pull-out drawer for snacks. They didn't need to go into the pantry. But, you know, that or sitting outside for me has yes. all from the time I was a little girl. I used to put music on. I lived in a little farmhouse. And so I put the music on, open my window, because it was right there, and sit outside my window mm. and sit in the sun. That and, and water. I, I know what helps relax me. Yes. I don't always get to have that in the environment that I am in. But I know what I need to do to clear my head and pull myself back together. Yeah. Music's yeah. a big deal for me. Yeah. Well, I find nature, being outside, playing with my dog. And and I think too, for, for people who maybe, as you said, maybe you can't access what you know you need in that moment, but even just, you know, 
giving yourself a minute to close your eyes and remember what it feels like to be, whether it's sitting out on that porch when you were a kid or, or, uh, you know, remembering a favorite song that can settle your nervous system too, just the memory of it. So do you sense. suggest for your clients, I don't know when they're actually done, like, do they get healed, quote unquote, and then they're done? Um, do you give them sort of a the tools like we were just talking about? Do you help them find those tools mm -hmm. that give them the release of the anxiety to meet the challenges that are coming to them every day? Absolutely. And a lot of people have the tools. They They know what the tools are. It's just they either they're so out of use or they're so used to just kind of going, going, going that they forget. But oftentimes, you know, as a resource that I suggest often, if people are open to it is using mindfulness and meditation to really give yourself that space with yourself, that time with yourself to better understand your own needs. And I think that's so much a part of the work that I do is to help my especially female clients, but male clients too, really understand what they need and learn how to advocate for it for themselves in healthy ways. And that yeah. relieves a ton of anxiety, right? You're not waiting for somebody else to know what you need and give you what you need. Well, as, well, and as a type A, yeah, as a type a personality, it's hard to stop and do those things. Oh, hundred percent. I get it. I do. I do. Um, and you know, med I, I always say that meditation doesn't have to be done sitting still quietly. It could be on a walk, right? You can take a meditative walk and notice the sounds and nature, or as you listen to your music, really tuning into the different instruments, you know, um, or the voices or the words, um, but just being intentional about placing your attention in that moment, whatever it is. You know, when Karen, I well, people so who say that they can't find that time, I was one of those people. It was like, well, I've got my podcast, I have my coaching, I got all these things. My son yeah. was moving away at the same time. And, you know, I was worrying about him, you know, being so far away. But what I found was that I ride a stationary bike twice a day. And I didn't realize until recently that that's where I closed myself off from everybody else. I might have the TV on and my husband can walk in the room and say, what are you watching? And I don't even hear him ask and he'll go change the channel. Doesn't bother me. Now, when I get off the bike, I might notice, or he might say, why didn't you talk to me? Huh. That's my 30 minutes that yeah. I need. And he's, he's a slow learner. He's finally starting to get it a little bit, but <laughs> I would never have thought about that as being my meditation time. And it is. Oh yeah. Yeah. Exercise definitely can be a meditative experience. I think walking, yeah. Biking, anything that almost forces you to pay attention to what you're doing in some ways, but it can also release the, that worrying thinking mind too, to, you know, think about something else. Exactly. Yeah. So how did you decide to do the podcast? Because I don't want to forget to talk about that. And we're, yeah. our time's almost up. Yeah. Well, uh, my podcast started as Women Warriors. So it was really focused on anxiety tools, different therapy models that really help relieve anxiety. And really the, the I would say the underlying thread was that we're exposed to so much trauma that we may not really identify as trauma. And that's what drives a lot of our anxiety. So it's how to take care of ourselves. But as I evolved in my own practice, my therapy practice and developed the coaching business, I realized that I wanted to really focus on women in midlife. And because it can feel so scary to make change and to do things differently once we reach midlife, to just show the possibilities of what's out there, what you could do, what things you can bring into your life, alternative ways of healing, but also um, sharing stories of other women who have made kind of drastic changes in midlife and really blossomed and grew and um, 
just being able to share their stories felt really important to me. I think it is important for people to, well, that's why we do this, right? This podcast. It's about getting through life's challenges. And it started off with a cancer diagnosis for me. Mm. I was a fitness coach for those people who are now listening to this, but didn't hear my story before. Um, and I would do videos. And Karen was watching my videos. And then Karen's wow. like, you know, you should do a podcast. I'm like, who's going to listen to me? I'm a little girl from Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> but she she wore me down after about a year. And we would do them together. And our guests would come on. It was radio style. And COVID pushed us into Zoom. Nice. But I feel like podcasts allow people to just sit and listen to somebody else without making a commitment. So, for example, they may listen to you on this show. And say, well, I like some of those ideas and use them and not need to reach out to you. Mm -hmm. But others will be like, oh, I like what she has to say. I need to find out more. So then watch your podcast and go to your website. You have a very nice website. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, yes, podcasting to me was a way to reach more women, you know, across the globe. Um, I think that's also part of why I, uh, started doing coaching too, just knowing that I could, with therapy, you are licensed in the States that you're licensed. It's very regulated, which is really important. Um, right. so I'm licensed in Maryland and Delaware, but coaching gives me the opportunity work, to work with women across the country as well as across the globe. So how do you get your guest for your podcast or is it just you talking? So I get a lot of, uh, um, well, Podmatch was one because I'm a part of that community, but I get a lot of pitches all the time. So people find the podcast. They're not always a good fit, but mm -hmm. I do, I, I probably get pitched at least three times a week from people. So I have to be careful and make sure they are the right fit for the podcast. Right. Um, um, so that's, that's been helpful. That's been easy, but also being in the therapist community, oftentimes it might be a therapist too that comes on, but right. not always. Well, you're a little more narrowed. We started out talking about the challenges of cancer mm, and we had several so guests on with that. Because yeah. that's what my videos changed to from fitness to like, how do you get through this challenge in life? You don't always have to have a good day. You, it's okay to not have a good day. Absolutely. It's okay to laugh at what you're going through. Yeah. But as we move forward and we COVID hit, I found that there are many other challenges for people. Yes. It could be money. It could be a relationship. could be a job. It could be promoting your business. Just talking about how do I do this? Mm -hmm. Because whatever we can help somebody with, we want to do with the podcast. Yeah. And so you're helping women, right? Yep. Specifically. Yep. yep. And yep. we try to reach yeah, out broad, in all different areas, a, a yeah. broad spectrum, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what's amazing about podcasting to me is it can be as narrow as even more narrow than my audience and as broad as, yeah, just helping people through challenges, which is great. It's amazing. It's an amazing so, medium, I think. And people there are so many out. people out there with challenges. Right. Okay. Oh, um, yes. Like I said, these two groups that I found online on Facebook, I mean, every day, um, talk about being overly sensitive. I'll read them. And mm. I just want to like crawl through the screen and say, you know, you're going to be okay, but you have yeah. to want to be okay. And that's, that's something that, I didn't even understand many, many years ago. It was like, well, I want to feel better. Well, how do you get there? And, yeah. you know, I have a husband who is very supportive, but at the same time, doesn't get it. Like, you're depressed? No, he shouldn't be depressed. Well, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be, but I am. And yeah. so I need to go find those tools to work through it. And I think if our society would be a little bit more open, it'd be so much easier. Oh, oh absolutely. That's what I we agree. started out earlier talking about, the fact that there's a stigma in our heads, probably mostly in our heads, for oh, somebody sometimes. generationally. Yeah. Not yeah. the younger kids, because they do it in a heartbeat. But for those of us who 
grew up at a time where it was just not cool. You just didn't do that. It might be on your job record. People will know. They'll think you're crazy. Oh, absolutely. All of those other things. And I think women are taught to handle everything if they can. Everything that happens in the home, the household, and if you have a job, it all falls on woman's back where not always the case, but most of the time men would be, well, that's her job. Everything's her job, raising the kids, taking care of the house, cooking, all of it. So I think um, mm -hmm. people need to know it's okay if you need help to get through those things, Absolutely. whether it's talking or whether it's hiring somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, I, so much of what I, you know, what people think of as therapy, like, oh, I'm going to have to rehash every horrible, painful experience in my life. And why would I want to do that? I would say most of the people that come see me are working through everyday challenges like you and like all of us, you know, and sure, does stuff come up from the past? Absolutely. But we, you know, I never force anybody to talk about something they're not ready to. Mm -hmm. So our yes. time is about up. Yeah. And what I'd like you to do now is just let people know how they can find you, contact you, whether it's social media, your website. Awesome. Well, uh, my website is, uh, well, my coaching website is elizabethcushcoaching.com and Cush is spelled with a C. Uh, my therapy website is called progressioncounseling.com. Uh, you can find me in both places. I am on Instagram and it's my podcast. It's Awaken Your Wise Woman. So you can find me there. That's probably where I post most often. Right now, I am offering a free guide for women in midlife who are struggling to make new friendships. So it's uh, navigating friendships in midlife. And you can find that at, I'll have to, I think it's like freeguide.com. Is, it off, your, is will... it off your website? I can, uh, yes, you can get it off okay. my website. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So go to the website and you can find it there. So, yep. And so I offer So to that. contact you would be through your website. Yes. The best way to get through Somebody's me, to me. Somebody's looking at therapy or. Yep. It's contact okay if they're in another me. state, correct? Or yeah. Coaching. Therapy. I'm only licensed in Maryland and Delaware uh, for uh, coaching. I'm available in any state and across so, the country. So, but if a person is in another state. Yep. Can you still work with them as a therapist? Yeah. I cannot uh, because licensing uh, guidelines restrict that. Um, but I, if they are interested in therapy and want to know where they can find a therapist in their area, they can certainly reach out to me and I would be happy to do my best to connect them with okay. the people that I know in that area. Wonderful. I'd throw out a quick idea for you. You see if you use it at some point. When my youngest graduated high school, we realized that the moms graduated too. And we tried to form a little group where we get together every so often. Nice. So I always thought that was an interesting topic because that's where our lives are, especially if you're a stay-at-home mom. Yeah. yeah. For 12 years. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden they graduate, they leave, and you're like, oh, my God, what do I do? My, those are all my friends Yep. who are also moving on and going through the same process. So yeah, we'll have to well, uh, maybe have you back and we can talk about that. Sounds sure. Good. Well, that's one of the reasons why I created that friendship guide because yeah, in midlife, all of a sudden things are changing and you're, you're changing maybe, and maybe friendships are, are shifting and going in new ways. So. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you thank for you guys both connecting for with me. us and let people know what your podcast is one more time because I messed that's up the name in the beginning. So I don't want oh, That's okay. It's called Awaken Your Wise Woman. Yep. You can find me on all the podcast players. And we all will right. make sure that all that is in the show notes. So there's yep. no reason why you can't find Elizabeth out there. And Elizabeth, thank you so very much. It's been wonderful having you on today. Thank you both. Thank you. It's really wonderful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.